Thank you very much, Miriam. Appreciate it. We're actually aiming to get to number one in the world right now, so we're not exactly there yet. So my name is Abdullah Snowbar. I'm the executive director for the DMZ. Uh, as Miriam mentioned, we are based out of Toronto, Canada. I am delighted to be here for a couple of reasons. Number one, in Mexico, uh, for me actually, Mexico is bittersweet. Bitter because my ex-fiance is from Mexico. Sweet because my sister-in-law is from Mexico City. So it's very, very, very happy to be here. Delighted to be speaking to you. Uh, and uh, I, I want to give you guys a bit of context to the DMZ, where we are, uh, and of course, how we got to where we are today. Um, so starting off, first so you understand, the DMZ is a technology incubator focused in downtown Toronto. We have right now over 40,000 square feet, five floors, um, and we represent more than 500 people and 75 companies. So that's where we are today. To date, we've supported more than 260 startups in building their companies. Uh, we've seen over 204 graduates. Uh, we've seen our economy uh, grow and prosper with 2,400 jobs being created, over $200 million raised in venture capital and other sources of funding. Uh, and of course, we've seen uh, a tremendous amount of interest in our space as well, which I'll speak to later on. So, as Maria mentioned, we've recently been ranked the number one university business incubator in North America and number three in the world. The reason why that's important is not just because it's about bragging, but it's also helped us as Canadians get on the international stage. And I know our friends from the Canadian Embassy here, Catherine, would probably appreciate this. She's somewhere in the room. But it's extremely important for us as, as Canada to be able to step up and show, and show the world that we have all the ingredients that we need to become one of the best in the world and not necessarily be distracted or be overshadowed by our friends uh, down south, America. So, this is, I want to show you folks a bit of our space uh, and where we are. So typically when I travel, sometimes it's hard for people to know where we actually live in terms of the city, Toronto. And it's quite interesting because as Canadians, you know, people have this perception that we live in cold climates only. We don't have, you know, uh, the infrastructure for, for modern uh, kind of communities and cities. So a bit about Toronto. This is actually where the DMZ is, where that big green sign. Um, this is our city, which we're very proud to be, uh, the number one most diverse city in the entire world. Funny story, actually. BBC recently went up and said that London and England was the most diverse city in the world. What happened, our mayor, Mayor Tory, of course, being a champion for the city, contacted BBC, said, I just want to verify your facts. Please check on this and, look, and get back to us. BBC checked their facts, they came back, and they learned actually that Toronto is number one in the world, and London was actually number four most diverse city in the world. So this has added a tremendous amount of value, not only for the DMZ and the university, where we are, Ryerson, but also added a tremendous amount of value for our startups in the way that they recruit, in the way that they actually build their pipelines, and the way that they can actually look at and access international markets. So, so moving on from there. So quickly about our history and where, how we started. So we, were, we started off in 2010, so we're six and a half years old right now. Uh, our focus completely was all around community. We did everything and anything we could do to build a strong community of not only entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs, students, VCs, government, media, angels, the whole works. And the reason that was important because you wanted to build something concrete that would actually add the value and, and, and become your value proposition in terms of what you're doing. If you, if you look at an example, Google. Google has built a phenomenal business in the past, but if you take all the really exciting, fun things about their community and pull it all away, what do they really have left? It's a bunch of geeky coders sitting behind computers working away. So we wanted to make sure that we can duplicate a model similar to that where we can build a strong community that can thrive off of each other. And that's exactly what we've done. Um, and we've also, we've also acted as a benchmark across the nation, being able to build the space that we've been able to build, really leveraging the entire community from where we are in downtown Toronto to the university, to working with all sorts of different partners from government to the, the private sector. It's, you know, it's really helped us in establishing a strong um, benchmark that we can obviously share and be able to collaborate across the nation. Um, and for us, it was always about being in the yes mentality. Everything and anything we did, we just said yes. This is in the beginning stages for us. We said yes to everything because we wanted to make sure that we are able to attract all the opportunities coming our way. And then later on, we started to shift. And in today's world, we're now looking at a different story altogether. And the story is really focusing on 
being more focused in our approach, saying yes when it makes sense, saying yes when it's going to add value back to our community, and of course, back to our startups. I'm losing my voice. Sorry about that. So what do we look for when we actually bring entrepreneurs? We look for really five things. First of all, it can be any startup, not just students from our university. Uh, and we, bring, we attract people from across Canada, but also from across the world. Currently today, we have entrepreneurs at the DMZ from Poland, Ukraine, India, and South Africa. And obviously, we want to be able to extend that out. And we'll talk about a partnership later on tomorrow, actually, about uh, what we're doing with Tech Monterey. Um, but we want to we open up our doors to anyone and everybody. But of course, we also support very much so the Canadian companies because we really take a lot of pride in being able to establish strong Canadian startups. Second thing is there has to be a problem we're solving. So there needs to be a social economic impact behind what they're actually doing in order to join the DMZ. The third thing is that they have to have a prototype in place, ready to go to market. One of the things that we pride ourselves off about the DMZ is that we host somewhere anywhere between 10 to 15 tours a week. So imagine that, 10 to 15 tours a week. These are opportunities for customer acquisition. These are opportunities for veteran capital. These are opportunities for collaboration. And these are definitely opportunities to be able to find advisors and mentors that can help you propel the company forward. These are things that we're, you know, this is part of the reason why we, when we see startups uh, at this stage, we want them to hit the ground of the DMZ and be able to acquire customers and investors uh, as soon as they touch ground in our space. The, thir the fourth thing is really all about building and having an innovative use of technology. It has to be proprietary, it has to be different, and it has to be actually focusing on tech. And the last thing, and probably the most important thing, and I don't have to tell a lot of you in this room why it's the most important, but people. You have to have a team that's going to be curious, coachable, and collaborative. We've spent years building our community, and the reason why our community is what it is today is because of the people that we have around us. So more times than not, more times than not, we've actually said yes to people who are extremely coachable, are extremely talented, but have a horrible business. And more times than not, we've said no to people who have a phenomenal business, but are really, really bad people in general. And the reason why is because we know is that when you bring on good people, they'll be able to adapt, adjust, pivot their model you know, as need be. And even if it doesn't work out, what would end up happening is we'd get them to shift into different companies or startups at the DMZ space. And for us, one of the big philosophies is that we do help companies fail fast, fail forward. So if you look at the, the, the simplest way of what we actually do, we either accelerate their growth or accelerate their failure and then have them move forward as well. And that's one thing that we're very proud about. The acceptance rate for our companies that apply is, all, is about 14%. So every person that applies typically has a 1 in 10 odds of actually making it into this space. Um, and the process itself takes about... It's a four-step process. They apply online. Uh, they're obviously pre-screened by, uh, by an application. Then they, then they meet with the executive team at the university, or at the DMZ, sorry. And then from there, they're, all, they're offered access to our community. Uh, we are sector agnostic. We do not focus in on one particular area. We look at many different sp uh, spaces. However, we do specialize a bit more in things like financial technology, biomedical, education technology, sports innovation, uh, and those are areas that we've seen a lot of interest in the city of Toronto, but it also gives us an advantage because we are literally one block away from the equivalent of Wall Street in Toronto, which is called Bay Street. We have a community of 43,000 students at Ryerson University, which allows us to leverage the education technology component, but we also have, we're on the busiest intersection of Canada. So we can, we, can, we, can, we can definitely just leverage all these different verticals to support the startups from the community that we have around us as well. So what do we actually do? So a company comes to the DMZ, what does it mean? They start at the DMZ, what do they get? I already talked about the big part, which is customer acquisition. One of the most important things we can ever do for our startups is give them access to customers, early sales, being able to validate what they're actually doing to show that it's actually a viable business and it makes sense for the market. And there's a product market fit, of course. The second thing that we do is offer capital. And we're really building out our venture capital network right now. We're spending a lot of time, not only in, in Canada and Toronto, but also around the world, talking to venture capitalists, angels. And I know that uh, Yuri from NACO will be speaking to you folks after this. And they've been a huge help to us as well. And the, 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 the fourth thing I'll talk about before I get to the third thing is our community. Like I said, having access to the university, to international partnerships, um, I know that Catherine's here again from the government. We use our trade commissioners like you would not believe. 
We love our trade commissioners across the world because our companies, like, like we are, all of our companies that come to the DMZ have an international mindset. And because of that, we have to be able to op provide opportunities for them to go abroad and look at ways of expanding what they're doing in different places. Keeping it in the, in the borders of Canada will not work. It's a small country, 35 million people, and we want our companies to be able to excel and, and, and move their businesses forward by finding the right partners across the globe, and I'll talk about those later on in the presentation. The most important thing that we offer is access to mentors and advisors, access to experts. The reason why, people come to us, but, you know, of course, everybody knows what they know. They know what they don't know, but then they don't know what they don't know. And that last part, they don't know what they don't know, is exactly what we offer them from the expert side, because these are the people that we bring in and we source. We spend a lot of time bringing people from across the country, from Waterloo. We bring people from, from BC, from across the nation, to be able to support our startups and the best way forward. Um, quick, uh, I'll share, I have a few of our success stories, I won't share all of them, but one of them that I'll talk about is actually Soapbox. It's the first company we supported at the DMZ. It's an innovation management tool and what it does, it helps frontline employees communicate with senior level executives. This, the first user and the first customer of Soapbox was actually Ryerson University. Why? We wanted to find a way to have students to be able to communicate with the president, vice presidents, and directors across the entire university without going through the struggle of bureaucracy and not being able to know where to go. So in essence, and I'll share with you quickly what it does. You go, a student goes online, they put in a question, and then they post a question, and then the students, there's all, all, the, all the students at Ryerson are part of this platform. If they like the question, they start to, they press like. The more likes you get, the higher it goes up the, the, the page, and at the end of the week it closes down, and the top question goes to the actual decision maker for answering. So the number one question, without doubt, for the past six years to our university president is, why do we need to have 8 a.m. classes? It's a great question. And every single time our president says, great, thank you very much for asking, we need to have 8 a.m. classes because we are short in real estate. We are in the busiest and biggest city in the country. Real estate is not easily at our disposal, so we have to be careful and we have to use the full length of a day. So that's a, and then after that, actually, this is a picture of Brennan on your right uh, and the Prime Minister of Canada, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on the left. Uh, Prime Minister actually used this platform when he was running for the Liberal leadership uh, to be able to communicate with his constituency and talk about issues that mattered. So I'll move on. One of, the, one of our biggest companies that came out of the DMZ is 500 Pixels. I'm sure of you might have, some of you might know this. It's the biggest, it's the world's largest photo sharing platform for professional photographers right now. Um, after they left to the DMZ, they moved down to the, to the valley, uh, to the Bay Area to open up their offices there. Uh, they liked it, but then they came back actually just two years ago to open up shop and their, and their headquarters in Toronto. Um, the last one I'll talk about is Rumi, one of my favorites and actually the only uh, registered not-for-profit or uh, company in the DMZ. We have many social enterprises, but this is the only not-for-profit that we have. And what they've done is they've taken $50 tablets that they source in a different country, and they've been able to take curriculum online for free and build curriculum on these tablets that they can actually put into developing countries. So they take content from Khan Academy and different places, Wikipedia sometimes, and they're able to build out content that would really support uh, countries like Liberia. So during the Ebola crisis, there was a huge problem with uh, education not being accessible anymore. So Rumi and Tarek Fancy in particular, the founder, who actually helped bringing cell phones into emerging markets, wanted to really see how he can solve this problem by bringing tablets into emerging markets. And what he's done, his first country was actually the uh, um, Liberia. After that, he moved into different parts of Latin America, actually. And then he also did some work in Canada with the indigenous community with the Aboriginal community as well, and that was extremely important for us because it solved a huge problem uh, that was obviously, essentially, it was causing a generational gap to happen and a lost generation. Uh, now he's actually working with the Canadian government in deploying thousands of these tablets to Turkey on the border of Turkey and Syria to, of course, allow student, young kids who want to learn uh, the chance to learn, and then when the time is right, they'd go back home to, to their country. Some of our partners that we work with across the board, and this, these have been an instrumental, instrumental part of our success, our corporate partners that have been able to support us, uh, provide opportunities for customer acquisition for our startups, uh, give funding, uh, and of course be able to open up doors and connections across the entire world. So some big names, and I'll share with you what we did just two weeks ago. 
and Maryam was actually there. We launched our brand new advisory council that, in which we brought on some of the most powerful and influential individuals in the entire country to help us propel and move our companies forward. So some of the things that we've done, we built out an in-house model for companies to live with us, um, and that includes IBM and Bluemix Lab. And what they're doing is they're actually they're, they're putting in a large team of people in our space to be able to work on app development for their clients. But the neat part is, as they bring in their clients, we've agreed that half the time is spent with them, and then the other half of the time with their clients is spent with us and our startups at the DMZ. And that's proven to be quite, quite tremendous. Um, the innovation model, Deloitte, these folks uh, built, brought on a small team, uh, and they did a spin-off essentially from a tech that, that they wanted to develop for their audit uh, uh, practice. So they house these guys at the DMZ, and they're building it away, not under the Deloitte banner, though. It's actually a company that they have no association to Deloitte, other than the fact that they had their initial investment from Deloitte. And then we run many different competitions called The Next Big Idea with uh, Bank of Montreal, one of the biggest banks uh, in Canada, uh, Rogers, one of the biggest telecoms, and of course, MasterCard. And then we have a lot of, these are just small examples, by the way, and then we do a lot of in-residence models. We heard about some of the things happening with Startup Mexico, but Intuit provides bookkeeping re uh, in-residence services for our startups, and of course, uh, Goodman provides uh, legal advice, but the real legal advice and we've actually, one of our stipulations for having a partner from the legal world work with us is that we wanted the name partner to be in our space. So we actually got Alan Goodman himself to be living out of the DMZ, spends two days a week to support our entrepreneurs because that's the kind of focus and that's the kind of priority we want these law firms to be able to put our community in. So moving along. So in our backyard, we're working with a lot of different uh, organizations from across the entire country, from coast to coast, uh, Communitech in Waterloo, and I know we have Catherine here from uh, University of Waterloo who will be speaking later today. Uh, we have folks from Mars who I think some of you might be familiar with, but we're working with the city and many different entities as well to really help in moving the organization forward and supporting uh, uh, startups and entrepreneurs across the world, uh, or across the country, sorry, but in the global uh, workplace. It's important to think about how you work with each other because for us, it's actually added quite a bit of value in being able to support entrepreneurs in different capacities. Sometimes we don't have the right resources in place. We can talk to our friends out in Communitech, and they're able to provide op um, connections and, uh, uh, and, and opportunities in New York, which maybe we're not as connected in right now. So they've done some really good work. Um, I'm going to move on from there. On the international partnership side, we've done a lot of really good uh, connections with many different incubators. Um, but in particular, we've actually also opened up an office, an outpost in India, where we've where we partnered up with the Bombay Stock Exchange, uh, and we have two floors there with 65 startups, and we've worked with, with places in South Africa where they're launching their space end of October. That being said, we're doing a lot of work focusing on, on entrepreneurs to be able to provide them with opportunities in the global marketplace, and we're always going to be looking at expanding the international reach. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through this quickly. What we do on the international side are things like soft landings, trade missions where we take our startups to a specific region where they have interest in. We do a lot of joint ventures like what we did in, uh, in India. Collaborative programs like what we're going to be talking about with Tech Monterey tomorrow. Of course, we do a lot of recruitment and pipeline for the DMZ. Uh, and then more recently, we're going to be doing a lot of international development with the Canadian government in Jordan, actually, building out two incubators in the country focusing on women and youth. Some of the programs that we have, Obviously, things like women in entrepreneurship, we're very proud um, to be able to do this. We currently have 30% of our, of our entrepreneurs are women founders. Good, but not good enough. And we are very, very clear on that, and we're now pushing the, the, the agenda forward a bit more to make sure that we can find better programs and support that can help uh, with the women uh, in building their startups at the DMZ. Uh, we have different events like the DMZ uh, Investor Series, the Next Big Idea Contest, uh, and then obviously things like um, the, our sales program which we're going to be building out very soon, focusing on accelerating the sales potential for our startups. But then, beyond the programming, it comes back to community. And what we do sometimes are simple things, like every Friday, we have a Good Scotch Friday. We literally come around at 4 p.m. every single day, hundreds of people in the DMZ, and we, we got sponsored by Glenfiddich, and we, we give everybody some, some scotch. And the reason why is we want them to come and share their story, successes, but also failures. And it's an incredible environment that you can actually bring people together in and have them share these things, but not having any other people around. Why? Because they have to have a safe space to be able to, to, be ta to talk about it. We run things like industry nights. We offer the best coffee in the city. And I can assure you that in our space, because we don't want people to leave, 
We offer free breakfast every single morning that's funded by our partners like IBM. And the reason why we offer free breakfast is not because we want to just tell people that we have free breakfast, but it was actually done recently because we wanted the staff and the employees of the entrepreneurs of the startups to come in earlier. The day we did it, we, we noticed a difference where people were coming in two hours earlier to the DMZ to start working. Why? Because we set a very specific time frame for breakfast to be served. They come in, they start working, they would eat, and then they, obviously it's, 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 a, it's a win-win. And these are things that our entrepreneurs can do that we were able to help them out with. And finally, we obviously serve, or we do a lot of socials and events that actually bring people together. And, and you, you're able to see people have a lot of the serendipitous moments. The chances for them to talk to one another, to interact, engage, and collaborate which is really what, we, what we've done. We've also built a large framework of other zones in the university. We have 10 other zones focusing on different platforms and different verticals. And these are people that are, uh, this, these are zones that are focused in their own space, their own leadership, and their own companies. But we've really built a network around the university now that's able to provide opportunities for 43,000 students to get engaged in innovation. And more, more importantly, zone learning has become a coined term uh, that the university is able to, u to use right now where we can actually provide innovation and entrepreneurship teachings, things like design thinking, you know, coding, whatever it may be, to every single student at Ryerson, and whether you're in nursing, fashion, business, sciences, engineering, it doesn't matter. Zone learning is an important core of what we do, and the idea is not to create 43,000 entrepreneurs. That would be a disaster for us. The idea is to create 43,000 people with an entrepreneurial mindset. And that's really the objective behind our leadership and our president, Mohammed Lashimi, at Ryerson. We also have a for-profit entity called Ryerson Futures Inc. that does early stage investments in, all, in our startups uh, as need be. Uh, they've been around for, uh, for four years right now. And it's really been a huge, huge benefit to have these folks living in the same space as us because it's providing real-time seed stage investments for companies to grow. I'll skip this part. Here's our team. I'll skip that part as well because I'm running out of time. Where we're going next, we're focusing on scale, scale and growth. In the, in the first six years of the DMZ, we, we put a lot of em emphasis around product market fit. Now, moving forward, we're putting a lot more emphasis, uh, of course, on scale and growth, but never forgetting our community. And the community that's obviously helped us build and establish what we have today. So our priorities moving forward is startups, community, and of course, business development. And I've talked a lot about these things, so I won't get into too much detail here. But I mentioned two weeks ago, we launched our advisory council. And the advisory council is now uh, helping us propel our startups and the DMZ forward. And this is actually the group of, what, of who we brought on. So some people you would notice probably, or maybe not, some of you are not from Toronto or Canada, but we have the president and CEO of IBM. We have folks, the head of Uber for Canada, North America, and in particular Latin America as well. We have the president and CEO of Deloitte. We have people who are running uh, banks in, uh, in, in Toronto, PC Financial the former chairman of the biggest telecom company in the, in the country, um, the managing director of Harley-Davidson. So I say all these names. Why? Because they're helping us do two things. Number one, they're helping us provide expert matter advice to our startups and be able to support them in what they're doing and make sure that we can obviously be able to, to, to help these folks become celebrities and champions and really put, them on, uh, uh, put the spotlight on them. But at the same front, it's about helping strengthening the, the, the broader business community for us and being able to establish stronger connections, not only for the DMZ, but for Ryerson University and for all the uh, uh, potential startups in Canada. So it's, it's, been a, it's been a long journey and there's been a lot happening over here, but the biggest thing I can tell you of what led to the success that we have is our people. The people is what made the DMZ what it is today. The people is what put us on the international ranking. The people is what actually allowed us to have successes uh, with our startups and our companies. And the people is actually what's helped build international cooperations. And not just people in terms of our startups, but like I said, it's going to be it's the people from our staff to our startups to our mentors, our advisors, and the whole network.